Thank you. Uh, first, let me just say what an honor it is to be introduced by Gabriel, who is such a hero, a hero of mine, who revived the fight um, in Quebec and this country. So it inspired so many of us. Um, so the honor, the honor is truly mine. Um, I, I also uh, um, want to acknowledge that we're here on unceded Algonquin territory and thank Anna Collins for that wonderful welcome. Thank Roger Rashi and all of the organizers of this extraordinary gathering um, for all the work you have been doing for many, many years and months. Um, <laughs> this is going to happen. You know before this is over, all the papers will go flying. Um, so, welcome. Bonjour tout le monde. Je vais parler en, en, en anglais, je m'excuse. But I also, first of all, I want to thank the translators who I know will do a wonderful job. Um, I've been thinking about precedence for this moment and the last time we have had a large-scale grassroots convergence of so many different social movements, so many different streams coming together um, in our country. And I don't think there is a direct analogy for what we're seeing here and what we will see here over the next few days. But, but I, I've been thinking um, about Quebec City in April 2001, really as the last time I remember. Um, I think there are some, some, some veterans of that moment here. Um, a time when, when our different sectors came together against a common enemy and to advance a shared agenda. Um, that's when Canada's social movements helped lead a continent-wide mobilization to stop the proposed free trade area of the Americas. And we didn't just come together, we came together and we won. The FTAA died, never to be revived, and it is a testament of the power of these kinds of convergences. But a few months later, in the anti-activist chill post 9-11, that movement died. Not our individual movements. They, for the most part, remained intact. Some of them expanded. But that coming together broke apart. That movement of movements, as we called it at a time, at the time. And many of us went back, uh, some of us fearfully, into our respective silos. Now, that breakup happened for many reasons. That's part of what I explored in my last book, in The Shock Doctrine, about how moments of crisis, of shock, make us lose our story, our narrative. Um, and in large part, that book was driven by that experience of, of being part of a movement that was kind of shocked out of existence before its time. The reason I think it's worth looking back is not out of some nostalgia. Um, because that movement was far from perfect, and I think already this convergence is getting things right that we didn't get right. I think that the leadership of First Nations people that has been, and the respect that has been in, uh, a huge part of organizing this summit and the success of this convergence um, is something we didn't do um, as well in 2001. But I think one thing that we, that, that we did do right back then is that we weren't talking about the personalities of individual politicians or the marginal differences between political parties. We weren't spending too much time talking about that at all or our respective electoral strategies. What we were really talking about was the economic system that underlied all of that, underneath it all. And that was not just free trade, it wasn't globalization as it was often called. We were talking about capitalism. And that's what we were talking about when September 11th changed the conversation. And it's taken too long, I think, for us to come together once again, but it is happening and it is significant and we must acknowledge the importance of that. So what is it that's bringing us together? I think it's a lot, it's a lot of different factors. Um, 
in 2000, 2001, uh, we were coming together because our various issues um, were being knit together by the ambition of these tra free trade deals, right? They were reaching into all of our lives, whether we were educators or healthcare workers, indigenous people, immigrants, everybody was affected by the ambition of this architecture. I used to say that we should thank the World Trade Organization because they built our coalitions for us um, with their sheer ambition. Um, and one of the things that's been happening over particularly the, the, fa the past five years is that we find ourselves in the midst of an extraction frenzy in this country, particularly around fossil fuels, but not exclusively around fossil fuels. Um, and we see this obviously with the tar sands, with fracking, we see it in large scale mining pro projects, mining disasters, although as my friend Harsha Walia pointed out recently, mining is a disaster, um, certainly at that scale. We see it in that metal monster of pipelines stretching towards us in all directions, Northern Gateway, Kinder Morgan, Energy East, Line 9. And just as the virtual tentacles of those trade deals brought us together before, now the very real tentacles of this extraction infrastructure is bringing us together. This infrastructure of death bringing us together to defend life and building new coalitions to do that. And once again, I think we have to be clear. Ultimately, this is not about stopping individual pipelines or an individual mine. It's not even about stopping the tar sands. It's about the logic fueling all of it. The logic that sacrifices life on the altar of money. And this is the same logic that our social movements who are focused on fighting poverty, fighting for housing rights, for health care rights, for education rights, are also fighting that fundamental battle between life, profit, life, and money. A system that would sacrifice the lives of certain people because they're deemed less valuable. Um, this is the logic at play in the epidemic of missing and murdered indigenous women. It's the logic that we see at play right now in Ferguson um, with the sacrificing of young African American lives. And I think it is the same logic that treats certain people as fundamentally disposable that is at the heart of the extractive economy, that declares certain areas to be acceptable sacrifice zones in the name of turning Canada into an energy superpower. It's a supremacist logic. It's a supremacist, supremacist logic that divides the world relentlessly into somebody's and nobody's, into somewheres and nowheres, or worst of all, the middle of nowheres. This is a logic that founded this country we called Canada. It is embedded so deeply in the logic of colonialism, which was always based on the myth of nobodies and nowheres and sacrifice zones. And it is this logic, I believe, fundamentally, that we must name and that we must build a movement to counter. Because we are living in a historic time where what we do in the next 10 years determines the fates for generations to come. Because we're not just living in a moment where it's only a river, a mountain, a watershed, a culture, a species being sacrificed in the name of economic growth. It's all this and more. It's the stability of all of Earth's systems that support life. Friends, we are up against a psychotic logic that has profoundly confused destruction with creation. And that is what we have to change. Not just by saying no to Harper's worst ideas, though we have to do that, but by proposing and demonstrating real alternatives, relationships to the land and relationships with one another that are not based on creating ever larger sacrifice zones, but on protecting and regenerating life in everything that we do.
And you know, we often hear when we talk about climate change in particular that you know it's about the fact it's it's about that we don't have um, the political will or that we don't have the right technologies. But the truth is, is it's not an absence of alternatives. I think we all know what we need to do. It's been clear for a long time. I think fundamentally it's an absence of conviction that we are up to this tremendous task, which we must admit is a terrifying task. It is both a huge responsibility and a huge honor to be alive and breathing in a moment such as ours. We know where the current system, if left unchecked, is headed. We also know how that system will deal with the reality of serial climate-related disasters. It will deal with it in the same way it deals with every crisis, with escalating barbarism, with ever more segregation between the small pool of winners and the ever-expanding pool of so-called losers with rampant disaster capitalism. We know that story. Lord knows I've told that story. To arrive at that dystopia, one we have imagined so many times in every sci-fi movie you could go to from Elysium to Mad Max to Snowpiercer, every time we imagine the future, it is that world of big winners and big losers. And to get there, all we have to do is nothing. Nothing. Just keep barreling down the road we're on. We don't even need to veer, let alone turn. The only remaining variable is whether some countervailing power will emerge to block that road and simultaneously clear alternative pathways to destinations that are far safer. That is the task before us. A movement capable of imagining other futures than that dystopic story we keep telling ourselves over and over again. A story about how we come together in crisis rather than apart. A story about how we find our best selves amidst those challenges because we know that it goes one way or the other. And I always said this when I was talking about the shock doctrine. When crisis hits us, whether collectively or individually, and we know this, we either fall apart or we find reserves of strength we never knew we had. We are tested in crisis and we are being tested. We can already see glimpses of these kinds of transformative movements, particularly in the fights where those life and death struggles are playing out in people's lives firsthand. I've been lucky enough to spend the past five years researching the rise of what some call the fossil fuel resistance. It's more than that. It is a movement against this logic of extractivism. I've seen it in this country in the incredible movement against the Northern Gateway Pipeline, which is a movement that is so much driven by love as opposed to hate. You know, it is, and, it, and it is building those rare coalitions and healing, in many ways, his, historical wounds because settlers are realizing that the only barrier to Harper's unending dream of extraction is, are the rights of First Nations people. Um, and this is not based on charity. Um, it's, it is based on respect and it's based on gratitude. And this is a major change in this country. But I've also seen this in movements, an incredible movement um, in Halkidiki, Greece, where communities, farming communities, are fighting a Canadian gold mining company called El Dorado. Um, and the way they're coming together, you know, people talk about how these are the, the most, it's the most intergenerational struggle they've ever been a part of. They say, we used to leave the old people at home to just watch television, but then we discovered they were the only ones who knew how to cook for 50 people. And they knew how to cultivate, um, you know, collectively. And they knew how to care for the land, and we had to learn from them. And... Um, you know, it's so interesting this, this, this company, that this company is called El Dorado, right? This is this highly kind of genocidal name and it's almost like the, the, the European colonizers are coming home to pillage themselves, right? Um, and 
And this is what this you know, moment is bringing. It's not that this is new phenomenon, it's that the sacrifice zone is getting bigger and bigger because the appetite is so voracious. Now we see this spirit, of, we certainly saw it in El Sepuktuk. Um, we see it in the fights against fracking all over the world where people are putting water um, first. We see it in fights in, against coal plants in Andhra Pradesh, India. We see it in an incredible shift in China, which is always you know, such a handy scapegoat in all of these discussions. Nothing we do matters because you know, China's opening a coal plant a week. We hear it all the time. There is an, a raging debate in China about the cost of this kind of economic development because people can't breathe, because people can't let their, uh, let their kids play outside. They have to send their kids to school wearing masks. I mean, there's nothing more fundamental than the right to breathe. And that right is being sacrificed in the name of growth and progress. And it is leading to a fundamental questioning of economic growth in the fastest growing economy in the world. Things are changing. You look up and down the Pacific Northwest at the incredible resistance movements against export to coal export terminals. Um, on and on. Every movement is different. But there are these common elements that you can start to see. First of all, tremendous courage and a willingness to do what it takes to defend land and water and air despite tremendous police repression. And there is always tremendous police repression. These new kinds of coalitions um, often, as I said, healing, helping to heal very old wounds. This insistence that water is of greater value than money, that no price can be placed on children's health. The fact that women of all ages are overwhelmingly at the forefront of these movements, often in the role of water keepers. A deep love and fierce protection of place. The bold and creative use of law, often with indigenous rights serving as the most powerful weapon. A revival of democracy at the local level, at the most local level. And I think the most interesting thing about this wave of resistance is the way in which alternatives and resistance are woven together. My friend John Jordan, who's a wonderful activist based in France, talks about resistance and alternatives being the twin strands of DNA. You can't have one without the other. And we've often paid lis, lis, lip service to this, but more and more, this is becoming the lived reality. Um, because people understand, who are on it, part of these frontline struggles, that they will not win unless they can demonstrate that there are other ways for communities to sustain themselves. So I think about the ranchers um, in Nebraska who built a clean energy barn uh, powered by wind and solar in the path of the proposed Keystone XL pipeline um, to show to themselves and their neighbors that they would actually get more energy from this one barn than they would get from the Keystone XL pipeline. Um, or a village in England that's in the midst of the fracking free-for-all, the dash for gas over there. Um, that decided that rather than just saying no to fracking, they would start their own renewable energy co-op. Um, and this community had been tremendously divided over the you know, jobs versus the environment question. Um, but then even, a, even people who were on the pro-fracking side decided to join the co-op because they realized they would be actually getting less expensive energy and that it would keep resources in the community. So really um, showing showing the alternatives instead of just talking about them, or the Black West Mesa Water Coalition on Navajo land um, that is not just resisting coal after having successfully shut down um, large coal operations, but also uh, coming up with a concrete plan to convert land depleted by coal mining into um, a utility scale solar power generating operation that would keep control and resources in the community rather than um, just take them out as so many green energy projects are doing. This understanding of the moral imperative to provide real economic alternatives to the suicidal economic path we're on um, is, I'm convinced, key to the success or failure of 
this historic moment, whether we rise to this historic moment. Because the simple truth um, is that the hope for humanity in many ways, at least in the climate context, rest in the hands of some of the poorest and most marginalized people on the planet, in our country and around the world. And by that I mean that the rapid rise in carbon emissions that we're seeing, um, as bad as Canada's record is, um, it's not happening in the global north. It's happening, the rise in emissions is happening in China, in India, in Brazil, in South Africa, because these countries are signing on to this same vision. Um, and that will not change unless there is another economic vision offered. Um, the biggest untapped pools of carbon, the ones that if burned will push us to four to six degrees of warming, catastrophic levels of warming, lie in indig on in under indigenous lands, whether in the Arctic or in Canada's tar sands. All of our resistance will only be a stopgap unless something fundamental changes in the balance of power between countries of the global north and south and within those countries. We will not stop climate catastrophe unless countries like Canada acknowledge our climate debt and help to finance transitions to another economic model entirely. We will continue on the path we're on unless there are real economic opportunities in First Nations communities other than mining and fracking in Canada. Communities will continue to be divided unless we take those responsibilities seriously. And when we talk about honoring the treaties, um, that includes the commitments made for real infrastructure, for clean water, for education, for health care. When communities are asked to choose between water, clean water, health care, school, and opening up a mine, it's pretty clear what's going to win in that case. So this is a moral responsibility. It's a collective responsibility. Now, one of the questions that you know, comes up most when I find I talk about these issues is more and more I think we recognize the depths of the challenge. But what we doubt, most of all, is our ability to rise to this challenge, our ability to do what it takes. Um, and I think it helps to look to the social movements of the past um, for inspiration and to also look at what went wrong. And I think that there are um, there are some really important lessons when we look at that history, and one of them is that we tend to consistently win when we win um, the legal battles, the cultural battles, the representational battles, and we often lose those core battles for redistribution, the economic battles. Um, so we end up more with the symbolic victories and the entrenched inequalities stay in place. Um, there's a quote from Martin Luther King um, that is one of those quotes that doesn't get repeated enough, and it's from 1967. He says, the practical cost of change for the nation up to this point has been cheap. The limited reforms have been obtained at bargain rates. There are no expenses and no taxes are required for Negroes to share lunch counters, libraries, parks, hotels, and other facilities with, wh with whites. The real cost lies ahead. The discount education given to Negroes will in the future have to be purchased at full price if quality education is to be realized. Jobs are harder and costlier to create than voting rolls. The eradication of slums housing millions is complex far beyond integrating buses and lunch counters. I think you could apply a similar analysis to so many of the liberation movements in whose footsteps we step. And this is not a criticism of those movements, it's just a fact that the second wave feminist movement was not just 
fighting um, for equality before the law, um, but also you know, the more radical elements were fighting for wages for housework, uh, for fundamental changes in the economy that would have required real distribution of wealth. The liberation, so many liberation movements had at their heart the redistribution of land and, the, and, and those parts of their movements were never won. We look at the great movement against apartheid in South Africa. They won the vote. They won the right to mobility. Um, but they were also planning to nationalize the banks and the mines. And it was that that was sacrificed. And that was the money that would have paid for the trans economic transformation in the townships. So on one level we can say we can, we, can, we can feel hopeless in the face of this history, but I've started to, feel, to, to look at this history differently, which is I believe that in rising to the climate crisis, if we really look at this and stop looking away, what we can see is that we have before us the ability to finish, to address the unfinished business of so many of our liberation movements. Because none of these movements went away. They never ended. They're still fighting. Um, and you know, I hope I've made the argument that addressing inequality, fundamental inequality, healing colonial wounds, is fundamental to our ability to address this crisis. And it's on, it's on every level. We need massive investments in the public sphere if we're going to weather the storms ahead and cut our fossil fuel emissions. Those represent the jobs, um, the opportunities that Martin Luther King dreamed of, um, that are part of the reason Ferguson is on fire right now. Um, the fact that that dream was never fulfilled. Um, and it's an opportunity to, to keep so many of the broken promises our ancestors made, um, or my ancestors made, in this country as well. Um, I'm just gonna, making sure we have a time for questions here. Um, So I want to talk a little bit more about what we can learn from the transformative movements of the past that did succeed in these big battles for redistribution of wealth, because there have been big wins. We know that after the Great Depression, the New Deal era, um, there was a huge shift in the balance of powers. This was you know, the era when, when union membership soared, um, when, when owners and bosses were forced to share far more of their wealth than they wanted to. Um, and with that transfer of wealth came the building of so many social services and, and structures that we are fighting so hard to defend now um, in the face of relentless attacks. I mean, it's also true that the abolition movement um, took on the most powerful uh, industry of its day and deprived the ability of slave owners to continue to make profit. It helped that the fossil fuel, uh, uh, the growth of in, uh, fossil fuels was waiting in the wings and a lot, of, um, a lot of those slave owners were able to transfer their money into the fossil fuel economy. Um, but, but it nonetheless represented um, a significant transfer of wealth. But we also know that that is another unfinished bit of liberation because reparations were never paid. In fact, reparations in many cases were paid to the slave owners but not to the slaves. Um, France was paid reparations for losing its slaves in Haiti. Um, British slave owners were paid huge amounts of money for the loss um, of their human property, but that property was never paid reparations to begin a new life. Our world is still scarred by these injustices. And I, I, and it's not going away. If anything, uh, if, if these past years have made that clear, I hope it's made that clear. And, and we have a moment. We have a crisis that is our moment to heal these wounds. It also means that the response to climate change does not need some shiny new movement that will magically succeed where all others failed. Rather, as the farthest reaching crisis created by the extractivist worldview, and one that puts humanity on a firm and unyielding deadline, climate change can be the force, the grand push, that will bring together all of these still living movements, a rushing river fed by countless streams gathering collective force to reach the sea. Winning will certainly take a convergence of such diverse constituencies on a scale previously unknown. 
because although there is no perfect historical analogy for the challenge of climate change, there are certainly lessons to learn from the transformative movements of the past. One such lesson is that when major shifts happen in the economic balance of power, they are invariably the result of extraordinary levels of social mobilization. At these junctures, activism becomes something that is not performed by a small tribe within a culture, whether that tribe is a vanguard of radicals or a subcategory of slick professionals, though each may play their part. It's something that is an entirely normal activity throughout society. It's rent payers associations and women's auxiliaries and gardening clubs and neighborhood assemblies and trade unions and professional groups and sports teams and youth leagues and so on. And Gabrielle mentioned the documentary that we made in Argentina. And I feel really lucky to have been in Argentina in that moment after the economic crisis in 2001 because I saw that, you know, this is often something we read about in history books, those moments when the whole society is in the streets. But I saw that in Argentina. On every street corner, there were neighborhood assemblies. And this idea of activism being something that is a specialist activity falls away. During extraordinary historical moments, both world wars, the aftermath of the Great Depression, the peak of the civil rights era, or these sorts of national uprisings that I'm describing, the usual categories dividing activists and regular people become meaningless because the project of changing society is so deeply woven into the project of life. Activists are, quite simply, everyone. And if we think about the task at head and the scale of capital that really needs to be challenged for us to safeguard the safety of our future, um, we, we need nothing less than that level of mobilization. The problem, once again, is that most of us living in post-industrial societies, when we see those crackling black and white footage of general strikes in the 1930s and victory gardens in the 1940s and freedom rides in the 1960s, Many of us simply can't imagine being part of any mobilization of that depth and scale. And here I'm not talking about activists, you know, I think for many of us we can imagine it. Um, but I think for a lot of people who don't identify as activists, that is the problem. And sort of the attitude is, you know, that kind of thing is fine for them, but not us, not with our eyes glued to our smartphones, attention spans scattered by clickbait, loyalties split by the burdens of debt and insecurities of contract work. Where would we organize? Who would we trust enough to lead us? Who, moreover, is we? In other words, we are products of our age and the dominant ideo ideological product. We have been changed by neoliberalism. This is a system that has taught us to see ourselves as little more than singular gratification-seeking units out to maximize our narrow self-interest, while simultaneously severing so much of us from the broader communities whose pooled skills are capable of solving problems big and small. This project also has led our governments to stand by helplessly for more than two decades as the climate crisis morphed from a grandchildren problem to a banging down the door problem. All of this is why any attempt to rise to the climate challenge will be fruitless unless it is understood as part of a much broader battle of worldviews, a process of rebuilding and reinventing the very idea of the collective, the communal, the commons, the civil, the civic, after so many decades of attack and neglect. And I think that's why so many of us were and continue to be so excited by the emergence of a union like Unifor and its commitment um, to social unionism and to the idea of reviving those principles in society because that is the first step to any of this. What is overwhelming about this challenge is that it requires breaking so many rules at once, rules written into national laws and trade agreements as well as powerful unwritten rules that tell us that no government can increase taxes and stay in power or say no to a major new uh, investment, no matter how devastating and damaging that project is, or plan to gradually contract those parts of our economies that endanger us all. We know this has to be done. It's just that we're told over and over and over again that it cannot be done. But yet each of these rules emerge out of the same coherent worldview. If that worldview is delegitimized, then all of the rules within it become much weaker and more vulnerable. This is another lesson from social movement history across the political spectrum. 
When fundamental change does come, it's generally not in legislative dribs and drabs spread out evenly over decades. Rather, it comes in spasms of rapid fire lawmaking with one breakthrough after another. The right calls this shock therapy, the left calls this populism because it requires so much popular support and mobilization in order to occur. So how do we change a worldview, an unquestioned ideology? I think part of it involves choosing the right early policy battles to fight, choosing our battles wisely. You know, to cite just one example, you know, climate activists usually talk about a carbon tax. Um, but it may be that fighting for a marginal carbon tax is a lot less useful than forming a grand coalition to, to demand a guaranteed minimum income. And that's not only because a minimum income makes it possible for workers to say no to dirty energy jobs, but also because the very process of arguing for a universal social safety net opens up a space for a full-throated debate about values, about what we owe to one another based on our shared humanity, and what it is that we collectively value more than economic growth and corporate profits. But I think more than that, it is about recognizing that the role of social movements is not to accept this distorted image of humanity that has been sold to us through everything from reality shows to neoliberal economics. It's to hold up a different vision of society, hold up a different mirror um, that says that humanity is not hopelessly selfish and greedy. That is our job to articulate not just an alternative set of policy proposals, but that alternative worldview to rival the one at the heart of the ecological crisis. Embedded in interdependence rather than hyper-individualism, reciprocity rather than dominance, and cooperation rather than hierarchy. This is something that all transformative movements <laughs> understand. Recent years have been filled with moments when societies suddenly decide they've had enough, defying all experts and forecasters. From the Arab Spring, tragedies, betrayals and all, to Europe's squares movement that saw city centers turned turned, taken over by demonstrators for months to occupy Wall Street, to the incredible students mo student movements in Quebec and Chile. The, The Mexican journalist Luis Hernandez Navarro describes these rare political moments that seem to melt cynicism on contact as the effervescence of rebellion, <laughs> which is a phrase I love. And what is most striking about these moments, these upwellings, is that they so often come as a surprise, most of all to the movement's own organizers. I've heard this story many times. It goes like this, one day it was just me and my friends dreaming up impossible schemes, the next day the entire country seemed to be out in the plaza with us. And the real surprise for all involved is that we are so much more than we have been told. That we long for more, and in that longing, have more company than we ever imagined. I, as part of this documentary project, I, um, I, I spent a little time um, in Athens and, 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 and in other parts of Greece looking at the extractions, anti-extraction struggles and I had the opportunity to interview Alexis Tsipras who is um, the leader of the official opposition uh, in Greece which is a, a left-wing political party called Syriza. And it's a very controversial political party because for a little while there it was really the hope of the European left. Um, and um, and in, in some cases, it, it hasn't entirely lived up to expectations. So I had an interview with, with Alexis Tsipras uh, for the next day, and I was sitting with a group of, of activists in, um, in Athens the night before, and I asked, I was canvassing them, I said, what question, what should I ask him? What should I ask Alexis Tsipras? What would you ask? And people threw around a bunch of ideas. And then somebody said, ask him, history knocked on your door, did you answer? And I thought, that's a really good question for all of us. Thank you.
Thank you very much. I'll be alternating between French and English. So Naomi will take some questions from the audience and will graciously answer your question. I will just ask you to please, if you have a question, to line up at the mic. And please keep it brief. Keep it to two minutes so we get as many people being able to ask questions. And of course, we give time to Naomi to be able to answer. Alors, nous allons passer à la période de questions-réponses. Je vous demande un peu de discipline, deux minutes, pas plus au micro, pour donner l'occasion à Naomi de pouvoir répondre à vos questions. So, thank you very much. Naomi just gave us a great presentation, uplifting speech. So, please, any questions to the mic. Nice. You're the first. Nice. Okay. First off, I want to thank you for being my modern history teacher. <laughs> I, uh, I graduated last year and I had no idea about all the anti-globalization movements that went on in 2000 and I discovered your books and they changed my life. So thank you for that. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm actually from Vancouver. I'm taking the train across Canada and I just happened to be in Ottawa the day that you're speaking and that we get to march on Parliament. So I'm very stoked. My, <laughs> uh, my main question is, uh, I firmly believe that, I mean, other than Quebec, which I go to tonight and I've never been, there's not much of a strong culture in Canada because we're such a young country. And I believe that maybe we can create a, culture, a cultural identity and some sort of a cultural shift. And I wonder, do you think that's possible to do and like bring everyone together? What can, what can we do to do that? Is it going to be the environment, you know? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> How do we bring about a cultural shift? Um, well, hmm. we'll share this mic. Um, well, first of all, it's wonderful that you're here, um, and thank you for your very kind words. Um, it, you, so I guess Molson commercials aren't doing it for you for creating Canadian culture. Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. You know. I really, I, I really think that events like this are part of the answer to that question because you, know, you use the word young and, and you know and 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 you know these are obviously really loaded words, right? Um, it's it's also a very you know yes the creation of this country we call Canada is young, um, but I think what is really extraordinary about this gathering is that it is quite an unprecedented collaboration between First Nations, Quebecois culture, and Anglophone culture. And it is, that is a process of creating a new culture together, out of respect, and by learning our real history. Nice, cool. That's what I'm thinking too. <laughs> Thank you very much. And uh, anybody else? Questions, please, line up at the mic. Thank I have you. two quick questions myself. Sorry, my voice is a little hoarse. I do music as well as our work and things like that. I'm back from BC. I was born and raised here in, in Ottawa. I love my city. And uh, my kids are back here with me to raise, or sorry, to grow with me as well. So two questions. Are you a mother? Yes. Are you a mother? Yes. Okay, great. <laughs> and <laughs> I have seven children, by the way. I feel like I all the test. same mother. All the same mother. <laughs> I don't change the plan. I don't deviate and... Because the thing is, is, I mean, being a young country, I mean, we do have an, an opportunity to grow. So, and also, may I use some of what I've recorded here today in one of my music videos? Culture um, is growing. Sure, no problem. Thank you very kindly. Not because I'm a mother, by the way. My name's Feroz, Feroz Manji. Um, I have numerous questions for you. It's just great. Once again, a fabulous presentation. This is an incredible leader who we are honored to have in our presence. Feroz, lovely to see you. No, me. Thank you. Um, English is full of euphemisms, and I think if we are going to build a movement, we need to avoid some of these euphemisms. Let's, let's actually talk about the real world. Call me on it. What did I do? It's not just you, I think we all do this. We talk about the extractive industry, extractivism. But you know, if you talk to any dentist, you will know that when you pull out a tooth, it's the real word for it, they call it ex extraction, but the real word for it is amputation. 
And when we are talking about the removal of non-renewable resources from the ground, from our societies, from across the world, this is amputation. So, so the argument goes that how much do you want to sell my leg for? How much are you going to give me for my leg? That is not development. And I think we need to start saying that there is a big difference between productive uh, economy and a destructive amputative economy. Thank you. Thank That's Feroz Manji, everyone. Look up his incredible writing. I think you just got a taste of it. Hi, my name is George. I'm from Tor Toronto. And one more thing that I wanted to point out, it was more a comment on his, on his question, on his comment, the, the things with euphemisms, is bringing to one of my favorite ones, unsustainable, just, just kind of devoid of meaning. We should use either one of its two, one of the two real words, either deadly or temporary, or even both. Both, because people talk about like unsustainable as, as if it's just something to something to avoid, something to avoid, void. But I think it, it leads to the question: these things are going to stop, but how are they going to stop? Are they going to stop, stop by stop like by killing us on the planet, or are they going to stop with without killing us? That's the big question. And I think as another thing is is you have when you. St talk about some of these movements, like especially against the northern, the northern gate, gateway. I think wha why that one's working so well is because the, is the Unistoden camp, it is not just blockading the, con blockading the construction, but it is providing, a, providing an exit strategy from the, from the economy, that's, economy that needs it by getting people back to their traditional ways. I think the reason that so many, many demonstrations and movements fail is because as the people are still dependent on what they're trying on what they're trying to stop like people have bill bills to pay like groups like the Unistoten are only they're they're successful because they are getting they're getting away from that and I think that is probably the only way that these movements can be successful so what's your take on that Thank you. yeah Thank you. It's a, I think it's a, it's a great point, and it was what I was part of what I was trying to get at about the way in which resistance movements are more and more building the the alternative to what they're resisting as they're resisting. Um, and you know, I I talked about the example of the Greek Greek movement fighting the El Dorado gold mine, and um, that's been a huge part of it. Has been um, it's it. It has been a revival of local agriculture um, and, and, and making themselves less dependent on outside forces because the, the whole model is ec what economic development means is an outside company coming in and providing jobs. Um, and they're trying to come up with a model that says, no, we can provide work, we can, we can provide food, um, we can take care of ourselves um, without that outside force. I mean, they're not letting the government off the hook. Politically, they don't want to do that. Um, but they are trying to get away from that model of what um, economic progress means. Oh, come on, there are some women in this room. Please help me out up here. I love you guys, but come on. I was going to propose to alternate genders, but <laughs> I can't alternate unless you go to the mic. Sorry, I, I didn't mean to say anything. No problem. No, that, that's quite all right. <laughs> uh, good afternoon, uh, Mrs. Klein. The name is uh, Robert Chisholm. I would like to raise uh, a very difficult question, which for reasons uh, that will become apparent in a moment, I think will be of some interest to the, to the students in Quebec. It concerns corruption in business and exposing and expunging such corruption uh, when people in the mainstream media have refused to even ask so much as one question about it. In particular, I'm referring to that huge engineering company known as 
SNC-Lavalin. We know all about the corruption involving the bribery, improper payments and so forth um, in Libya and a few other things. Um, <clears throat> the, thing that, um, the thing that's on my mind is how to expose uh, corruption that they perpetrated back in 1991 where they refused to pay up in a wrongful dismissal lawsuit and as a result um, had an entire floor of office furniture at their downtown Montreal headquarters seized and then sold, followed by seizure of their bank account. And yet nobody whom I've uh, talked to in the mainstream media has, con has uh, consented to ask the company so much as one question about their conduct. Um, <clears throat> I'm airing the question now. I'm not expecting any quick or easy answer to this, but perhaps um, it's something we can start to at least look at. I'm wondering what, uh, what you would have to say about something like this. Thank you. Um, thank you for your comment. And it isn't, in, I know this will come as a huge shock, but I don't have something to say about absolutely everything. I wasn't um, expecting <laughs> But we are having a press conference in a couple of hours. There'll be lots of journalists there that you, you should ask, you should put that to them. Um, but th thanks for what you said. Oh, great stuff. That's a good start. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Please. You called for women to come to the mic. Okay, you've Thank called, you. You've called for now some. You'll probably be really mean you've called for some voices. Uh, May Chazen, thanks very much. Um, I'm going to keep it very short. You made mention that uh, the biggest growth in fossil fuels is coming from the global south: China, India, South Africa, Brazil and a need for alternative visions, but I'm just curious if you have any suggestions for alternative visions, because I worry that sometimes we turn the responsibility to people in the global south to cut their fossil fuel emissions when in fact we're the ones who got us into this mess in the first place, and so obviously we have some responsibility um, in yeah. curbing our own fossil fuel use and not yeah. relying on them. Yeah, that's a great, a great um, question. and. Um, and I don't. I, I didn't mean to imply that it is a. It, you know that that we're off the hook in any way. It's just a fact in terms of where the growth in emissions are at. Is that even if we in the north curbed our emissions, you know, pretty sizably, um, we we would still be on a a pretty terrible path, right? Um, because the, the growth in emissions, and that's what's really changed basically since 2000, like before 2000, global emissions were going up by about 1% a year. And then in, in 2000, starting in 2000, over the decade, um, emissions started going up by around 3.4% a year. And if you look at where those greenhouse gases are coming from, the, it, it, it is, it, it's intimately tied to the so-called emerging economies, which some people joke are like the submerging economies. I mean, it's an incredibly bizarre word, emerging economies, but that's the discourse as if they didn't exist before. And um, so it's not a question of um, saying we're off the hook. The, qu the question is, if we do nothing, this is going to continue to happen um, because it's the only economic development path um, um, that, that is on off, offer. And if you go to the climate change summits, um, basically you know, the, the, the argument is, well, you started it um, and you're not doing anything, so we're going to do what you did even faster and on a bigger scale and, you know, this is not working. So the counter argument to that is climate debt that I mentioned, which is, which is essentially what our governments have already agreed to, although Canada, you know, bailed from the Kyoto Protocol, but in the original climate change convention was the principle called you know, common but differentiated responsibility. And common but differentiated responsibility means that we recognize that everybody has a shared responsibility to stop catastrophic warming, but the countries that got a 200 year head start on emissions need to start first. And that was built into the Kyoto Protocol. That's why the U.S. never signed it explicitly. They didn't sign it because they said, if China's not signing it, we won't sign it. So this has been the fundamental issue that has broken down all climate negotiations, is the refusal to recognize historical responsibility. Um, 
so in terms of alternatives, there's all kinds of alternative models. You know, one of the most inspiring one was, was one that was developed by a group in Ecuador called Acción Ecológica for the Sunni National Park. Um, and this is an incredibly biodiverse, rich rainforest area. Um, you know, this statistic like there's, you know, more species of trees in one hectare than are in all of North America. And, um, and it also happens to have a whole hell of a lot of oil underneath it. And so the proposal was, it is not only Ecuador's responsibility to keep that oil in the ground, it's the responsibility of the world, but particularly of the industrialized countries that created the climate crisis. So the proposal was for um, compensating Ecuador for leaving the oil in the ground, and for that compensation to go towards investing in social services and in um, green energy models, right? So Ecuador should not have to sacrifice um, its right to fight poverty because of a crisis it did not create. Um, but neither, it, you know, is it free of all responsibility? So you know that was a fantastic plan, um, and and the world governments didn't step up, you know, um, and and now. Rafael Correa, the president of, Me of Ecuador, is now saying he's going to drill in the Yasuni. Um, and I think it's a really classic example of what happens when you have that abdication of responsibility. But there's no shortage of models, you know. Like, really, really great work is going into this. And um, there's, uh, um, yeah, I think Acción Ecológica is actually one of the most visionary of these um, environmental organizations. They really pioneered the concept of, ec uh, of ecological debt and then climate debt. Thanks. I'd love to read some more about some of the alternatives. I don't know if it's coming out in your book that you've come, come across. And um, just kind of add to the discussion the question of what do we actually have to give up if we're serious about solidarity with indigenous communities, if we're serious about solidarity in the global south around climate justice. No, 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 no. A humble suggestion because I was in the middle I and know, the din is so strong of the people talking, so no I'm problem. asking the speaker the Thank questions you. to speak louder and maybe the people around to have a din lower, like whisper among yourselves, please. S'il vous plaît, merci. Merci beaucoup, Jivan. Please. Uh, I just want to give a shout out to my first year professor who introduced me to your writing. Um, it was amazing, so well written. Just, ah, it really made me feel like I could do something just because I was so much more knowledgeable about what was going on. Um, so my first book was um, The Shock Doctrine, which I read a little bit, just a little bit. I'm still working my way through it because uh, it is quite dense. Sorry, <laughs> my voice is a little shaky because I'm so nervous. Uh, <laughs> so uh, my first question would be, um, when I read these things, when I read anything, um, when I read anything uh, like about, for example, Harper spending like $160,000 just to change the name of the Museum of Civilization to the History Museum, and now they can't afford like assistant professors, or you hear about uh, the tar sands in Alberta and that sort of thing, like, you kind of feel helpless in those situations and you know that, like, those were bad decisions that were made and not reflecting the kind of values that we as Canadians want to strive for. Um, so who do you turn to in those situations where you feel helpless but you want that help <laughs> and you want to feel, like, empowered and able to do something or where you can, like, feel like, yeah, just, you could do something. Thank you for thank you for speaking um, and and for your kind words, which I did hear, even if other people didn't. Um, and uh, and and it's you know it takes courage to go to the mic, by the way, people. Um, so thank you. I, I mean, the only thing I would say is just that you're in exactly the right place, you know? Um, and that's what I think most of all convergences like this are about, is about realizing that we're stronger than we think we are, um, and that, you know, the problem with staying in our respective silos um, is that we, we feel weaker, you know? Um, this, this, you know, we have seen some incredible social movements in the, just in the past few years. I mean, I don't know more, the Quebec student movement, these incredible resistance movements against the pipelines, things are changing. Um, part of what makes us feel helpless is that it's not reflected by our major political parties in any way, shape, or form, and it's not reflected in the media. Um, so, you know, we get a really distorted picture of ourselves reflected back to us from both the political culture and the media culture. And that's why these face-to-face -face gatherings are so important, because it's a really good reality check. 
because um, we're not as isolated as we think we are, and we have real power. And this is not just, you know, I think you, people are going to hear uh, later t today at, uh, um, on Parliament Hill, tomorrow also from Clayton Thomas Mueller, who's an incredible leader in this country, um, on, you know, with I don't know more, Defenders of the Land. You know, Clayton talks about how, you know, the, the importance of the labor movement coming together and the indigenous rights movement coming together as forces that really can interrupt the flow of business as usual. This is not just about having a big rally. Big rallies are cool, right? But it is about actually looking for the vulnerabilities in capital. I mean, when you think about indigenous land rights in this country, that what that actually means is that a lot of the resources, the vast majority of the resources that that's, those mining companies want to get out of the land, they don't actually have a right to extract. And what they are banking on is that there isn't the political power behind those legal rights to stop them, right? And that is what we need to change. And that's where these coalitions, you think about workers coming together. <laughs> We're gonna have to wrap it. Hmm? We have to wrap it. Thank yeah. you. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for coming to the mic. It's been a while uh, for Naomi up here. Also, it's very important. Our next move is, of course, going to Parliament Hill. So let me point out that you have some school buses there which will ferry you to the War Museum. And at the War Museum, it will be one contingent, and as I explained earlier, there's another contingent coming from the Gatineau side and a contingent coming from Victoria Island. So, in order to be able to get everybody to the rallying point and then so that we can start the march, the, the bus organizers have asked me to propose this to you. When you line up, line up against that wall at the end of this little square here and try and form as much as possible groups of 50 because each bus can take 50 people and there will be marshals there to try and help you to get on the buses. So thank you Naomi for coming out tonight. Thank you for being here. Thanks to you all for making this a great event because the event is not being up here, the event is being down there. Thank you and thank you Naomi. <laughs>